Coming up ahead in this episode of X Talk Spotlight. You know, you, you'll always hear from a pediatrician that kids are not small adults. Pediatrics is different. And so now I get to say to my later phase drug development colleagues that clinical pharmacology studies are not just small phase three trials. They are unique. They require specific expertise. Hello, and welcome to X-Talk Spotlight, illuminating insights from subject matter experts and industry thought leaders. I'm Sonia Hunt. In this episode, we're asking the question, how can you manage the complexity of early phase clinical development? Drug development has always been complex and costly, with many assets failing to progress to marketing authorization. In this X-Talk Spotlight edition, we'll explore how competing objectives, timeline pressures, competition, and costs make the move into clinical development daunting. To help us shed light on this important topic, I sat down with Dr. Oren Cohen, Chief Medical Officer and President of Clinical Pharmacology at Fortria. Dr. Cohen partners with biopharma companies to optimize early clinical development through excellence in study design and execution. He and his team at Fortria have built a wealth of experience and interconnected capabilities designed to help navigate the complexities of drug development. Thank you for taking the time in this spotlight interview, Dr. Cohen. Thanks, great to be here. So to start us off, what are some of the factors driving the complexity of early phase clinical trials? Yeah, I think this is really an area that has exploded in complexity over the last decade plus or so. And I think there are a number of reasons uh, that we see complexity increasing so astronomically in the early clinical space. Certainly, the fact that the cost of drug development overall continues to increase and is really kind of breaking through or threatening to break through the $2 billion per asset uh, line is, is certainly putting a lot of pressure uh, on the industry. And as the internal rate of return within the pharmaceutical industry overall, it, we've seen it maybe recover a bit last year. But if you look at, you know, a 10 to 15 year trend, it's it's a worrying trend downward. And so that is driving um, a lot of competition. There's a lot of great science, and that is is certainly great news. Uh, but of course, uh, every company with an interesting asset is kind of under the gun to prove its point uh, early, earlier and earlier, the earlier, the better. And so that, I think, is driving um, what we see in the clinical pharmacology space, uh, you know, protocols that are packed with complexity, trying to get more and more uh, answers uh, at an earlier and earlier stage, and that has a lot of downstream consequences. Um, it, you know, I think the the other thing that that may be contributing here, and it's sort of on the cost equation overall, but uh, these days a lot of innovation is acquired, right? So small biotechs have disproportionately taken the seat, taken the driver's seat here and um, you know the prices that are being paid to acquire interesting molecules that have interesting data early on can be quite astronomical um, even in the in the billions of dollars and uh, you know searching the memory banks it strikes me that probably um, you know the hepatitis C drugs uh, around a decade, maybe more than a decade ago, uh, were probably some of the first to strike these super high uh, acquisition costs. And that trend has continued. And so I think that additionally, you know, just just adds to that mix, that, that pressure cooker of um, competition and high costs and uh, and therefore driving that complexity to try to get earlier and earlier insights into uh, a drug's prospect. So uh, that's, that's, the, that's the storm that we find ourselves in the midst of. 
And how does this complexity manifest in the early phases of clinical development? Yeah, that is uh, something we can get uh, very, very graphic about because what what we see um, in study protocols that are uh, passed along to us for for consideration and that that we would like to participate in, um, those have changed radically over that last decade, decade and a half, and so. You know, 10 to 15 years ago, the norm in the early clinical development space, the, the clinical pharmacology space, the norm was for a company to undertake a first in human study trial, which is called a, a SAD study. It's an acronym. <laughs> so it's not a SAD study, but it's a SAD study, that single ascending dose study. And that, that was the whole study, a single ascending dose study. And then once the results uh, came in for the SAD study, we would move to a MAD study, and that's another acronym for multiple ascending dose study. And so we would go through this in in a in a series of of studies, accumulating evidence, accumulating data. Um, you would get the full characterization of a molecule from a a pharmacologic perspective. Um, and, and that's the pace that it went at. Well, with all this pressure cooker uh, environment that I, that I described and the scramble to get earlier and earlier insights, a not atypical study protocol today is a combined study that includes single ascending dose, multiple ascending dose. It'll have a food effect. It may have drug-drug interaction components. And then at the end, you know, there might be a couple of cohorts of patients in addition to the normal healthy volunteers that were the, the typical early part of the study. And so it has multiple components now that run through uh, enormous complexity, all wrapped up uh, with a bow around it in one single protocol that's actually in, in, you know, a decade ago, that, that might've been five or six separate studies that are all rolled into one now. Um, and so that's the most obvious manifestation of complexity is in, uh, in the trial design, but there's additional, uh, complexity that we see all throughout the space. One is in the intellectual property itself, the drugs themselves have become enormously more complex. And that's as a result of the science becoming more complex. Drugs are, uh, you know, the mechanisms of action that we're being led to by the science are incredibly complex. Um, immunologic signaling cascades. I mean, it, it is far more complex than, you know, a decade or two ago. It was, it was a simpler time of more straightforward um, receptor interactions, receptor antagonists, um, we're, we're way beyond that now. And as a result, also a decade or two ago, the vast majority of drugs that we would be testing in the clinical pharmacology space would have been small molecules. And now we see small molecules, large molecules. We see uh, antibody drug conjugates. We see RNA uh variations on RNA, gene editing, gene therapy, enormous complexity in the actual assets themselves, reflecting that complex biology underneath. So then, as I already alluded to, the, the incredible complexity in, in the trial design, crossing over not only in normal healthy populations, but in patient populations as well. So um, it's it's a lot. It's a lot of complexity to deal with. That's, you know, that's what we're, our, our mission really is to manage the complexity in the space. Um, that's, that's essentially uh, our, our business model today is, is, is dealing with and managing that complexity. And that leads into my next question. Um, what tools or strategies specifically are most effective for managing these complexities? We have completely re-engineered the way that we do clinical pharmacology studies so that a decade ago, um, 
like most clinical pharmacology businesses, the the center of the universe was a clinical pharmacology unit or a clinical research unit. And that is a, a clinic setting, uh, the four walls of, of a clinic. And you would have uh, folks there from various disciplines to carry out all the procedures required within a protocol. But essentially, that's how it was that's how clinical pharmacology was done. It was done in a clinical pharmacology unit. Well, we've revamped that model. The, the clinics are still a super important part of the tool set that we use to manage the complexity, but it's not everything. And frequently these days, we're working in one study across multiple clinics, and they may be our Portria clinics. They may be external sites. It may be a combination that crosses between our sites and, and other sites. And so consequently, the way that we project manage these studies has changed radically as well. So our model used to be that project managers were based in the clinics because that's where all the activity happened. That's where they were project managed. Uh, and that's, that's how we um, that's how we ran the traditional clinical pharmacology model. That's totally on its head now, and our project management group has increased massively to deal with the complexity. Um, and they're they're not site based. They manage the studies because the studies are frequently multi site. They're managing um, in a in a site agnostic way. Uh, which is fit for purpose for what we see in terms of these protocol designs. So all of our methodology has changed. Um, you know, fit for purpose infrastructure is very important. We've made investments in that infrastructure. Um, brand new fit for purpose uh, clinic in our in our Leeds location in the UK. It's really designed for modern, complex clinical pharmacology protocols. We've expanded. Um, a couple of our U.S. clinics. Uh, we put brand new CGMP pharmacies in. All these things are really super important to ideally manage the complexity that we see. We've also gone totally digital. We have a, a bedside data capture system. So um, the old days of paper-based trials are uh, are well behind us, and that's a good thing. In order to deal with the complexity, you really do need it. A, uh, a a digital system. So, you know, that's some of the the tool set that that has really radically changed the um, the picture of of how clinical pharmacology studies are done these days. Um, and and it's um, it's been it's been a journey. Uh, and uh, you know, we see we see the result. We see great, uh, uh, really great ability to manage. Um, enormous complexity in the space uh, to get to get these very important trials done in in an efficient way, but in a very precise way that yields the data needed to make good decisions. And finally, how can you take a proactive approach to risk management in the planning and execution of early phase clinical trials? This is such an important question um, because in in clinical pharmacology. Um, I know my, my colleagues and, and classmates that went into pediatrics for, for decades have been telling me, you know, you, you'll always hear from a pediatrician that kids are not small adults. Pediatrics is different. And so now I get to say to my later phase drug development colleagues that clinical pharmacology studies are not just small phase three trials. They are unique. They require specific expertise. And so... Um, Part of the way we manage risk, and and there is risk in clinical pharmacology. I mean, first in human studies, these are um, these are our investigators and nurses and and technicians that are, um, and, and you know our heroic study volunteers agreeing to participate in these medical experiments. And there's a lot of testing that goes into ensuring that that it's that it's safe. But that is part of the experiment to make sure that it is safe. Uh, and so that that requires not only that 
fit for purpose infrastructure, but the skill set, uh, the dedicated skill set. So all of our people who work on clinical pharmacology studies, that's what they do. They do clinical pharmacology and they're totally dedicated to it. But, you know, it's, it, it's a special responsibility to, um, uh, to, to undertake these uh, experiments in humans that, that pose risk. And, and the way we deal with that is, um, is by using a proactive methodology that's tried and true, and many high-risk industries use this methodology. It's called failure modes and effects analysis. It's a kind of a fancy term, but but really, in essence, it's looking very carefully at a study protocol and going through it with a fine-tooth comb to understand, um, you know, what what might go wrong here. What is what is different about this study that's not simply watching somebody swallow a purple pill? You know, what complicated dosing device? What what complicated sample collection for biomarkers or pharmacokinetic assays? What special storage conditions are there that are specified in order to get the essential data and in order to protect the safety and well-being of our research subjects, which is always paramount? We think it's incumbent on us, um, and everybody should do this, to use that tried and true methodology to to wring out all the risk in advance as much as possible um, and to mitigate in advance so that nothing does go wrong. Um, it's much better, you know, some wise person once said, uh, an ounce of prevention worth a pound of cure. It's the, it's the same sort of thing. And so um, it's, it's tr- been tremendously valuable uh, to use that methodology, get all our teams involved in that uh, analysis of the protocol before we actually start doing it um, to, to really understand where the risks might be and work out in advance um, how, we're miti- how we're going to mitigate it and, and, uh, and hopefully prevent, prevent something from happening. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Cohen, for speaking with us today. We really appreciate your time and insights. It's been a great pleasure. Uh, Really enjoyed it. And uh, thank you very much. We look forward to learning more about Fortria's work in early phase clinical development. Thank you all for joining us for this X-Talk Spotlight feature. We hope you enjoyed the discussion.